I think how Jesus suffered on the cross for me, dying there in shame and agony, so that I could be redeemed and live eternally. I can do no less than Let's stand and honor the Lord in prayer before the message. Once again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to share and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray that Jesus Christ would be real unto us, Father, for we are a needy people, Lord. We ask today, Father, that as we continue to go on with our seminar, that number one, Father, our seminar would exalt, magnify, and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that your word would go forth into our hearts, Father, showing us the things, Lord, that are not centered around the Lord Jesus Christ, convicting us of those things in our lives, Father, that are keeping us separated 
from fellowship with you. And Father, we ask that as your word goes forth today, it will convict our hearts, that it will minister, to, uh, minister unto us today here, Father. We ask, Father, as we bind, rebuke, and cast down the strong man and every one of Satan's strongholds from off of this service, from off of the people here, Father, that again, Father, your word would go forth with power into our lives, Father, so that Jesus Christ would receive all the glory and the honor and that we could worship him, Father, not just with our mouths, but our lives could be a living testimony unto our Savior, Father. Clean us up, Lord. We really need a lot of help in our lives, Father. We ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Well, we're starting to come towards the end of the seminar. We'll have a mass deliverance uh, after this message. And a lot of great topics have been talked about here at the conference. But you know, in ending, and for the last message of the conference, I don't think there's a topic that's more important. They're all, all the topics are important. You know, there's, uh, we all have favorite verses, favorite chapters, favorite books in the Bible, and really none is actually any better than the other one. But sometimes there are topics that are, that are more important than others, and probably the most important doctrine in all the scriptures is called self-denial. Because without self-denial, without us denying ourselves and putting down the things that our flesh wants to do, we're never going to accomplish anything for Jesus Christ. And we can come to the church and we can raise our hands and praise the Lord and we can put on a happy face and we can come and, and have a good time in fellowship together. But it, it's what's happening inside of us is what the Lord looks at. Remember what Samuel, I think it was Samuel who said to Saul, he said, listen, the Lord looks on the inward man while man looks on the outward. And we can all come and fellowship together and have a great time. But Jesus Christ sees what's on the inside, what we really want. And there's a verse over in Philippians chapter 2, a very important verse in Philippians 2, chapter, chapter 2, verse 21, that says, For all seek their own, and not the things that are Jesus Christ's. And I don't know if there's any one thing more important than for us to seek the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, the first and greatest commandment in the New Testament was also the first and greatest commandment in the Old Testament. And that is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul. And then Jesus Christ in the New Testament says, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. And this love that he's talking about is a love that gives with, without wanting to get anything back in return. Because, see, that when you love somebody to get something back, that's not really the kind of love that Jesus Christ, the agape kind of love that the Lord wants us to have one for another. Because we do that to get something back. But when we do something for another person's benefit, for another man or another woman's benefit, that then comes back unto us. We seem to have had things turned around in the church. If we will pour out our lives into our brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ will bring joy and happiness into our lives. Instead of us going after joy and going after happiness so we can feel good about ourselves, and the reason we don't feel good about ourselves is because we're not really serving the Lord. We're not really doing those things he told us to do. Because when we do, he fills us with joy. As the apostles walked the earth after Jesus Christ went home to be in glory, to sit at the right hand of his Father, these men were persecuted. These men were lied about. They were slandered. Every town that Paul went into, he ended up in jail. The, all the epistles were written from jail. And you can't tell me Paul was a happy man. But I can tell you that Paul had the joy of the Lord in his heart. And it didn't matter, in, even in jail, after they were whipped and beaten, and their backs were laid open with a cat and nine tails, Paul and Silas sang songs in the night unto the Lord. And how did these men do this? How in the world could these men do this after being whipped? after having their back like an open meat market, how can these men sing songs in the night to the Lord? Because they were denying themselves. They knew the better good that they needed to do was to minister to other people at all costs. And that's what we need to do as Christians. These are the kinds of men and women that God is looking for in these end times, men and women who will put aside the things that they want in their lives and go after and try and help people out because we're a hurting people today. We have a lot of problems in our lives. We have rejections. We have fears. We have all, all, kinds of, uh, all kinds of emotions in our soul that are being stirred up that we just 
can't seem to get a handle on. Yeah, we go to the pill bottle, but you know something? After four hours, five hours, eight hours, the pill wears off. And we're back in that same state that we were just before we took that pill. Many people today turn to alcohol, even in the church. It is a secret, hidden sin, even in the church. They turn to alcohol because they are burdened down with so many problems in their lives. They have so much emotion. Their mind, their wills, and their emotions are fragmented. This is what the devil does. Make no friendship with an angry man, lest you learn his ways, and it will bring a snare to your soul. Our, snows can, our souls can be snared when we make friendship with people that we shouldn't do this. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world? We can literally go out there and get a, grab all you can because you deserve it. You're king's kid, so you go out there and you grab everything the world has to offer and you gain everything. You have houses, you have cars, you have the best education, you have the nicest clothes, you have all kinds of friends around you, but what shall it profit a man or a woman? if they gain the whole world and they lose their own soul. What shall we give in exchange for our souls? We can exchange parts of our mind, wills, and emotions for things that the world has to offer. But Jesus Christ has something much more than that for us. He has something better than that for us, and that's a life that is totally dedicated unto him. Let's turn to Luke chapter 13. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 14. Turn to Luke chapter 14. We're going to look up in verse 27. Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Jesus says, And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now let me quote from J. Peterson. What part of that verse do we not understand? <laughs> what part of whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. See, we all want to be, a, as Phil sang the song before the message, we all want to be a friend of Jesus. Amen? And, and we want to do these things that the scripture says do. And the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Because the flesh must be subdued. And that's what Jay was talking about earlier in his message. Everything is not deliverance. Now, we gear these conferences towards deliverance, but there are many times it's not an evil spirit in our lives. It's the flesh that we need to crucify. Now, when we crucify the flesh and the, demon, and the demons are still there, then we need to get the demons out. And that's where the ministry of deliverance comes in. But we need to bear his cross, and we need to come after him. And if we can't do this, we cannot be his disciples. Now, we can say we're his disciples, but he knows what's on the inside of us. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sits not down first and counts the cost, whether, it be whether, whether you have sufficient to finish it, whether you have all the materials. If you go to build something, you're going to have all the materials to do it, because if not, you're going to look foolish, the scriptures say. But it's the same thing in Christianity. We need to sit down and count the cost of this ministry, because this ministry will cost many of us our lives. Many of us here, if we will go on with the truth of God's word, we will be like Paul, locked up, lied about, beaten. Many of us here, if we stand for Jesus Christ in the end times, will give our lives for Jesus Christ. And wow, what a great thing Amen. to be able to take crowns, to be able to take our robes, and just cast them at Jesus' feet when we get to heaven. Amen. Wow. That's the kind of men and women you say, well, I don't, I don't want anything like that. Or I want that, but I just, I don't want to go through that. That's okay. Just determine in your heart that you want to do that, and the Lord can start preparing you for that time. But he says we need to sit down and count the cost, lest happily after he laid the foundation, he's not able to finish it, and all that behold what you're building begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. It's the same thing in deliverance. Don't get involved in the ministry of deliverance without counting the cost. If you're not willing to give of yourself and die to yourself for other people, because that's all this ministry is about. This ministry is not about money. This ministry is not about fame and fortune. Nobody's name is ever going to become popular. Listen, Pastor Worley preached for 25 years, at least 25 years, of deliverance. He pastored 47 years in churches, and in the religious community, he was an absolute 100% failure because his church wasn't very big. Can you imagine preaching 47 years and at the most you have like 130 people? 
and maybe maybe 75 of those are, are real hardcore workers, and then even, even a lower number of that are those that are really dedicated? Well, you're in the religious community, you're a failure because, of course, big is good, right? Not necessarily. I always liked his example. Big isn't always good because, you know, if something dies, what would you rather bury? A dead gnat or a dead elephant? <laughs> and there's a lot of dead, dead elephants today that, that are stinking up the place that need to be buried. Or in verse 31, or what king going to make war against another king sits down first and he consults whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him that's coming with 20,000? Well, that's just common sense. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth ambassadors and desires conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsakes not all, he cannot be my disciple. Now, again, I don't know what part of that we don't understand. If we don't determine in our hearts to be able to forsake all, that doesn't mean that right now, immediately today, right, you have to give up everything. But it have to mean you have to be, it, what it means is that you have to be willing to do this, and Jesus Christ will do this. It's just like salvation. So many times people say, well, you know, I, I drink, and I smoke, and I cuss, and I do all these things, and I can't really get saved. But see, that's the person that really needs salvation. Because Jesus Christ will do that for him. He will take those things away. I can't stop drinking. I can't stop smoking. I can't stop cursing. I can't stop committing adultery. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him work on the inside, and those things will then start to change. It's the same way now that we are born again. If we will just determine that this is what we want to do, and then let the Lord work in our lives, he will bring this off. And yes, it may hurt a little bit, but it's not going to hurt as much as if we tried to do it in the flesh. See, Jesus Christ, because Jesus Christ can change attitudes. He can change feelings. He can change the way we look at things. We can't do that. But he can do that in our lives. So we have to forsake all if we want to be his disciples. Well, that's just kind of ugly, isn't it? Let's turn to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I want to talk to you about two contrasting views here on self-denial and on preeminence. Now preeminence is, is, is a teaching, preeminence is a thing that makes people want to be more than what they are. It, and there's a good preeminence and there's a bad one. So I want to show you the two contrasting views in Scripture talking about preeminence. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 16 Paul writes, For by him, by Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. And by him all things consist. Now the reason Paul is writing this is because there was Gnosticism in the church. Now you say, well, what's Gnosticism? Gnosticism is an earthly, worldly kind of wisdom. And it, it's, it's earthly, sensual, and demonic, or devilish, as James would say. Because Gnosticism brings in what's called fables and genealogies. And you read about those over in Timothy. Fables is Greek mythology. That's what the word means. It means the study of Greek mythology, the study of gods and angels, and how and Greek mythology is very popular today here still in the United States and even teachings inside of the church. And then you have genealogies, which is the old Jewish history. And history has a funny way of changing. People have a, have a habit of embellishing upon history sometimes to make things more than what they are. That's why Paul warned Timothy against genealogies and these fables that only minister questions unto people. They never can come up with the answer because one question just always leads to another one. And again, many of these things have crept into the church. And so Paul was laying a foundation here that Jesus Christ, all things were created by him, whether they are in heaven or on the earth, whether we can see them or whether they're invisible. It doesn't matter whether they're thrones, dominions, and some of these are heavenly kingdoms and some of these are earthly kingdoms that he's contrasting here in verse 16. And it says, And he, Jesus Christ, is before all things, and by him, by Jesus Christ, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in all things he might have the preeminence. 
See, Jesus Christ must have the preeminence in our lives. If we want to be disciples of him, that means we need to forsake all our feelings, our wants, and our desires. And you say, well, God just, he doesn't, what, does he just want me poor and he doesn't want me to have anything? No, God will give you the world if we will just give it up in our hearts. If we won't let the world control us, he'll give us the world. He wants to give us riches. He wants to be able to entrust us with things that we will use for his kingdom, but not for ourselves. Because the self-life is what brings destruction into our lives, and then we minister that destruction to other people. As we teach people that you should get for yourself what you can. Jesus Christ must have the preeminence in our lives in all things because he is before all things. By these very seats that you are sitting in, you're sitting on the power of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the glue that holds those molecules together that holds that wood that you are sitting on. It's the, it, it's the, it's the, it's the bonding in the mortar that's in the bricks that holds the building up. He's the, he's the rubber, he's the, he's the uh, elements, you know, the 100 and whatever elements. It is Jesus Christ, it is the power of Jesus Christ that is in those elements that literally holds your tires together so you can go down the road. By him, all things were created. It doesn't matter. See, Jesus, that's why we must give him the preeminence. That's why we must keep him and put him first because God says, I'm not going to share my glory with another. He's not going to share. He's not going to let us take praise upon ourselves because the arm of flesh shall fail. Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes his arm flesh. We need to get out of, the, out, of, out of those things that we want for ourselves and find out what the scriptures are saying. And this is hard. This is not something that's easy to do. But all the Lord wants us to do is determine in our hearts to do it and he'll do it for us. We don't have to do it ourselves. This isn't a garment that we put on. Oh, I'm doing. You know, we see this at Christmas time, paganist time. We call it sometimes. We we see this at at, at this funny holiday. And now I, I you know after seeing the holidays and seeing all the money that's spent and how many how many people go crazy at the holidays, I finally understood what Paul was saying about where he says I I, I I'm in fear of you because of all these holidays that you're serving all the time. I mean, most of these things come out of paganism anyway. They're laced with witchcraft. God's not in the majority of these holidays if he's in any of them at all. I mean, I don't get, I don't get the three days, uh, the three days uh, of being dead from Friday to Sunday. You don't, ha you don't have to be a mathematician to figure out that's not three days. But because it's a holiday and we need to feel religious on holidays, that's the reason we have a lot of these things. But you know, at Christmas time, you see people, they'll, they'll show people on the news that are bearing these crosses, that are walking down the street bearing these crosses. We see religious systems today that, that make people do works and penance to try and please God. But those that are in the flesh cannot please God. Only those that are in the spirit. Because the spirit wants to do all these things for us. We can't do it ourselves. We couldn't do it in the Old Testament. How are we going to do it in the New Testament? That's why I mentioned the time, the thing about the seven promises of the promise keepers. Why do we need seven more promises when we couldn't keep the original ten? We don't need more promises. We need Jesus Christ. He will do this. See, we don't need to learn morals. We need to fall into agreement and let the fruit of the Spirit come out of our lives, and then we'll have morals. We don't have to put them on. They'll come out. We, don't, we can have a gentle spirit. You know, what is the fruit of the spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, faith, goodness, temperance, meekness. And people work at this in the church. They work to be good. But if we will just fall into agreement with the scriptures, this thing will come out from, out from inside of us. We won't have to do anything for it. We won't have to learn these things. We won't, as Paul said, you know, he, we won't have to go to a man and learn these things. Jesus Christ will just give us these things. And what does he tell us in Peter? He wants to give us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Everything that pertains unto life and godliness, Jesus Christ wants to give us. Not through a man, but through himself. But it makes us dependent upon him because he wants us dependent upon him. And so we see in Colossians 1.18 that in all things he must have the preeminence. And it's interesting, on the mountaintop experience, wow. 
Peter, James, and John. Can you, can, you, can you think about it being there on the mountaintop when you're standing there and all of a sudden Jesus Christ is transfigured before your very eyes? Wow, and you don't see him as the son of man. You don't see him as a friend or as an unusual fellow that's doing all kinds of things that, that they couldn't understand what he was doing. All of a sudden you see him start to shine, shining so much that you can't even look at him. And you see him and all of a sudden, bingo, who's standing there with him? Moses and Elijah. Wow. The, Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets. And of course, Peter, the first one to always open his mouth and everything, Peter looks and says, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Yeehaw, man. Because <laughs> remember, they were still in Old Testament days. They, they were still in Old Testament days. And so, I mean, for Moses to appear, and I mean, they realize this is Moses. You know, I mean, we, you know, when we think of Moses, we think of Charlton Heston. But this is the, <laughs> this is the real guy. Hey, did you, did you ever go out to, um, uh, what's that park in California, Universal or wherever that, you know, did, did you ever see the, the model that's set up on how they parted the Red Sea? What an embarrassment. Well, I mean, you look at the movie and you think, wow, that's really neat. But when you look at it, it's this 20-foot model and, and then they film it, you know, and they run the film backwards and you think, oh, man. I mean, God literally parted the Red Sea with Moses. What an ex And then Moses, of course, being the lawgiver, being a prophet and the lawgiver, but he was more of the lawgiver. He was there putting up with all the things that God's people, what a, what a figure he was and still is today to the Jewish people. So Peter's sitting there, eyes big as saucers. You could have hit his eyes off with a paddle. <laughs> and all of a sudden, then he looks next to Jesus on the other side, and there's Elijah. Whoa. Elijah representing the prophets. And then the voice came from heaven after Peter said, it is good for us to be here. And the voice came from heaven and said, this is my son, hear him. See, Moses is a great figure and we can learn from Moses. And Elijah is a great figure and we can learn from Elijah. But, but God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. You hear him. Amen. Don't worry about the prophets. Don't worry about the law. You listen to Jesus Christ. Wow. That's the same thing over in Hebrews chapter 1, where in times past, God spoke unto the fathers, unto the patriarchs, by the prophets. But now in these end times, he's speaking unto us through his Son. Again, Jesus Christ having the preeminence. He's not speaking to us today through the prophets. He will give us prophecy. But by the way, if you'll research the word out, you'll find out that not all prophecy is a prediction of the future. Beware of these people that have a word for you. Just don't, and beware of people that want to lay hands on you. I remember hearing the story from Pastor Worley about the person down south, a, a, a prophet. And he was a prophet because he called himself a prophet. And he, and he told, he went up to Pastor Worley, he says, oh, here's Sister So-and-so. I love to give her a personal prophecy because every time I do, she gives me $50. Made him sick. Charlatans, heretics. Beware of people. And you know, it's funny because the prophets come up to you today and they look at you, and this very serious look, and they'll look at you and they'll say, God's telling me that you have sin in your life. And you need to deal with it. Well, you know something? That could apply to every single person here. And so the person stands there and goes, oh, God's talking to me and he's telling me I got to... Listen, God's telling us every day when we wake up, get out of our sin. But really, that could... Now, seriously, that... And that's a lot. They tell you that. They tell you something that is very generic that can apply to 99% of people. And on a rare occasion, they get hung up. You know, your husband, your husband is doing this. And I remember hearing one lady say, well, I don't have a husband. <laughs> so they're kind of careful about this thing with prophecy. But getting back, we need to have Jesus Christ having the preeminence in our lives. He must. It's, it doesn't matter what we think about it. It's what the scriptures say, so that in all things he might have the preeminence. And remember the religious leaders? Who are you? By what authority do you do this? Will you please tell us for the 15,000th time who you are? And he says, Jesus said, I've already told you. How many more times do I have to tell you? He says, the reason you don't hear me is because my word is not in you. Ooh. 
That was an ugly thing to say. So let's contrast this and turn to 3 John. The third epistle of John. There's only one chapter, and so if you go to 3 John, you're there. And we're going to look at the ninth and 10th verse. John is writing under the church in 3 John 1, 9. He says, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, receives us not. Wow. There was a man there that was very jealous and envious of what the disciples and the apostles were doing. He was envious and jealous of them because he couldn't produce what they were producing because he wasn't one of them. He was one of the goats. And yet he, was, he had this church that he was so-called pastoring. And so when John was trying to write and come unto the church and teach the church, Diotrephes didn't want anything to do with it because it needed to, it needed to be around Diotrephes. Diotrephes wanted to have the preeminence. He wanted people to look at him because he was the great one. He was the one giving the messages. He was the one that was so-called sacrificing for everybody. But he has everything backwards. Because that was his responsibility. That's the job of the leadership. The leadership isn't to get... To, you know, when Paul, Paul says, listen, I didn't come for, you, for yours. I came for you. In 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, talking about money, which is a big topic in the church, it's always great for the word faithers to quote from 1 Corinthians chapter 9 about the sowing of the seed, which we learned yesterday in math. I think it's in... Is it Luke chapter 11, Whatever, where the seed is the word of God? But what, they, what the word faithers fail to tell you, what the leaders that teach about this thing of sowing, reaping and sowing, is that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where the whole story is set up to begin with, it's the Macedonian saints who don't have anything to begin with, yet they reached deep into their pockets and they gave not only their money, but they gave of themselves. And you know something? When, Paul, when they came unto Paul, they came and said, Paul, we want you to have this money. And Paul says, no, you can't give me your money. You don't have any money. Paul didn't want the money. Read it close. Paul didn't want anything to do with the money. He didn't want their money. And they begged him, is what the King James says. The Greek says they literally begged him to take their money. It's funny, Paul wasn't asking for it. See, if we don't ask for money, the Lord will give us the money. In the church I'm talking about, if the church will just quit asking for the money and rely upon Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ will give the church money. He'll give them enough to pay their bills. They won't always have to create some kind of crisis to get God's people to reach in their pocket so they can extort their money. They don't have to create some kind of problem. They don't have to make up some kind of lie or come up with some kind of new doctrine through revelation knowledge to reach into our pockets to steal from us. Because if they will just do what the Word of God says, if they will just be rightful, honest ministers of God's Word, God's people will give to the church. And they will give what the church needs. Because that's what they always did. They will do these things if we will just get out of ourselves and not do what we want, but do what the Word of God says. And it is most important that we do that. But Diotrephes wanted to have the preeminence. Diotrephes wanted to be number one and be first in everything. He wanted all the people to look at him. He wanted everybody to say, this is the great man of God. This is my pastor. And Diotrephes, oh please, I'm so humble, I don't deserve such recognition. Please go on. That's the kind of man he was. So it says, John says, I wrote unto you, but Diotrephes, who loved to have the preeminence among them, he received us not. He didn't want anything to do with the truths of Jesus Christ. He didn't want anything to do with the doctrines that the apostles were bringing forth. He was going to do this himself. Verse, verse 10, John got him real good. He says, wherefore, when I come... That's interesting. He says, when I come, I, just, I was just in Australia uh, for uh, the deliverance ministry has opened up now in Australia. And when I went there, I preached and it was a very busy schedule and we had a wonderful time in the Lord and, and many people got their eyes open to air and, and many people came knowledgeable of the deliverance ministry and I didn't hear a complaint. I heard one complaint. <laughs> one complaint. A dear lady asked me, do you see anything good in the church? 
and it really threw me off because I'm thinking, oh man, I'm trying to think, well, I, I think people get saved. <laughs> and later on, it, it bothered me all afternoon. And later on, I went back and I, I said, I'm sorry, I just don't really see that much good. I know there is good in the church somewhere, but I just don't see a lot of it. I see a lot of the error and the false doctrine. But John, John writes here, he says, wherefore, if I come, do you know when I left is when everybody complained? Nobody would come and talk to me. Nobody was going to, nobody, see, it's easy. That's the same thing that happened to Paul. I'm not comparing myself to Paul. I'm just saying that when you come with the message of truth, see, people can't, we can't fight truth because truth is just this big thing that stands in front of us. But the minute you leave, they'll lie about you. And that's what happened when, when I left. Everything fell apart down there. And now the Lord is starting to restore things. And, and people were attacking this, that, and, you know, this man saying this. Why didn't they come to me? Because they have no doctrine to back it up on. See, I have my guns loaded when I go into these meetings, and what I say, I can back up. And they can't. And I'm sorry, that's just the truth. That's not pride, that's just the truth. I'd be foolish to stand out here and talk about things that I can't back up because somebody might call me on the carpet and I'd look pretty foolish. And that's the same thing with all of us, brothers and sisters. You know, it's one thing for you to hear things, either a book report or, or you might read something or hear something, hear something that, that's, that is bad going on in the church, but you need to research that out for yourself. You need to find out for yourself so that when somebody asks you about these things, you can say, oh yeah, it's right here. I heard the quote myself. I heard it with my own ears. I read it with my own eyes, out of their own material. See, we need to be equipped to answer those people that are going to ask us questions or else we're going to look very foolish. And don't think the devil's not going to throw people our way if we don't know what we're talking about. That's why I've told people I will love to sit down. I'm a very nice person to sit down and talk with. Just bring doctrine. I don't want experience. I want Bible. And if you can show me in the Bible where it's wrong, I'll change my theology or I'll at least go and I'll pray about it. So what happened is John, he says, when I come, I will remember his deeds, which he did, pratting against us with malicious words. And he wasn't even content with pratting against them with malicious words. All these lies and slanders that Diotrephes was saying about, about God's men, about the men that were bringing forth the message, he says they weren't even content with that. But he didn't even receive the brethren, and he forbid them that would come in, and he cast them out of the church. He didn't want anything to do with it. He was going to do what he wanted, and I'm telling you what, God is not looking for that in us today. He's looking for those of us that will give ourselves unto the Lord Jesus Christ, fall into agreement with what, with what, we, with what he has to say, and then he will give us that power. When Jesus Christ went into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, his heavenly Father, God was tempted testing him. And he, and he did everything that he was supposed to do. He defeated the devil with his word or with the word of God, which is what we now have. And when he came out of being tempted, it says he was now full or he, was, he went in full of the spirit, but he came out in the power of the spirit. Because we need to be obedient unto God's word. If we're not obedient unto God's word, we're not going to have the power. We may have the Holy Ghost. You hear about that a lot. All right, do you have the Holy Ghost? We may be full of the Holy Ghost, but that doesn't mean we have power. It comes from a Greek word, exousia, authority with God. We can have authority with God. He will trust us when we are obedient and we pass those tests. And every day the Lord brings tests. He brings tests into our lives to see what we are going to do. And if we pass the test, then he gives us that ground. And as we hold it, then he gives us another test with more ground. And that's what he does. He tests us to see if he, can, if he can trust us with these things. And so we have two contrasting views here. Jesus Christ having the preeminence and a man having the preeminence. Now where does preeminence come from? Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. Preeminence comes from, of course, Lucifer. I'm talking about the evil side of preeminence. The self-life. I will. I want and I will do whatever I have to to get it. And I don't care who, what, or anything that gets in my way. I will claw, maim, kill, murder my way to the top if I have to because I'm going to get it. And that's what jealousy and envy says. Isaiah chapter 14, let's look at verse 12. 
How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet verse 15 says, Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. There are five I wills that, that Lucifer put into practice in his own life trying to overthrow God trying to do more and be something that he was not created to be. And we should not be more than what God has created us to be. Now let's look how God, see Satan had five I wills, but you know God have five I wills also? Let's look at God's answer to this in Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. Ezekiel 28, verse 15. Thou was, thou was perfect in all thy ways from the day that you were created, till iniquity was found in you. And by the multitude of thy merchandise, you have filled, you have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore, number one, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. Number two, I will destroy thee. O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of the fire, thine heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Number three, I will cast thee to the ground. Number four, I will lay thee before kings that they may behold you. Thou hast defiled, verse, tw uh, verse 18, thou hast de defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities and by the, the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee and it shall devour thee. And number five, I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. And all they shall know thee among the people from among the people shall be astonished at thee, uh, that thou shalt be a terror, and, shall nev and never shalt thou be any more. Satan's five I wills were defeated by God's five I wills. God is not going to be outdone here. We cannot outmatch him. We cannot even come close. We're either going to do what he wants us to do, or he's going to allow us to be destroyed. He's going to allow the evil spirits to work in our lives because that's what he uses to drive us back to him. Do you know that we, when we are in rebellion, when we sin, we open ourselves up to evil spirits? And so God uses these things. I remember Pastor Worley saying that the devil, is, the devil is the wrench, the monkey wrench, that tightens loose nuts. And sometimes we're loose nuts. And God allows the enemy into our lives. God allows curses. The Bible says the curse causeless shall not come. But we give it a lot of causes because we're envious, we're jealous, we're hateful, we're backbiting. Of course, not on the outside, and especially not in church, just behind the scenes. That's what's in our hearts. But that's where God looks. Because Satan had said in his heart, I will do all these things. We say the same thing in our heart. Not in our flesh. In our flesh we're all nice and happy and smiling towards everybody. Oh, it's wonderful to see you. I can't stand that person. <laughs> this destroys us. This keeps our doors open. These revolving doors. Yes, we may repent. Yes, we may use 1 John 1, 9, God's bar of soap, to, to restore fellowship. But it's just an open door back, up, back open to the demons again. And that when we allow these things to work in our lives, they drive us to sin against God. The more we sin against God, the more the evil spirits come in. The more the evil spirits come in, the more we sin against God. And that's why we've got to close the door once and for all, fall out of agreement with the devil, get out of the self-life of what we want, and find out what Jesus Christ wants, because one of these days, he's going to do this for us anyway. And you say, well, I'll just wait for that day. It's going to hurt a lot more. All these things. And, you know, some of us aren't going to survive it. Our houses, our bank accounts, our automobiles. What's going to happen if we name the name of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden as the new age takes hold and you say, that can't happen, read history. Right. We are doomed to repeat what we don't remember. Right. Read history. See, we, we are just fat and lazy in this country Amen. because the church is not under persecution. 
You go into a country where, church, where the church is under persecution and you'll find a real church. You'll find a church that is serving Jesus Christ. You'll find a church that wants to serve Jesus Christ because that's all the church has is Jesus Christ. It doesn't have anything else. In Cuba, the church is flourishing. The home churches, I'm not talking about the state church. I'm talking about the churches that are in the homes. They're doing the best they can to shut them down, but they can't shut it down because God's people are catching on fire. Hallelujah, praise God, but not in this country. We can't get anything going in this country. The first trip to Indonesia passed where we, we expected 40, 50 people at the most to come. Five, six, seven hundred people came. The, the auditorium only held 500. There were 600 in there before they finally closed the door and there were still people outside. Who, who advertised? Nobody. No radio, no television, nothing. People just began to hear something was going on in Jakarta. People were coming out of the mountains, coming from the islands, saying we heard something was going on. The Holy Spirit told us something was going on. We come back to California for a meeting, two weeks of advertisement, uh, newspaper and radio. You know how many people showed up? 100. <laughs> See, we're, not, we're not interested. For all seek their own, not the things that are Jesus Christ. We're seeking the things that we want and not the things that God wants. Listen, brothers and sisters, let's just ask the Lord now. Lord, help me. I know this is true, Lord. I know that I'm not giving you what, what I'm supposed to. Help me fall out of agreement with the devil. Let's ask the Lord to do that. He wants to hear from us. Amen? Amen. Okay, so we see that Satan was defeated by, by God's five I wills. If you would, turn to the book of Esther. Turn to the book of Esther. You know, there are a lot of people in Scripture, and of course, we're not going to have the time to, to talk about probably 95% of them, but there are some people's stories that are, that are more important than others, and just some people just love to have the preeminence. They will do anything for people to worship them. That's what, that's what Lucifer told Jesus. He says, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world if you will just worship me. And I'm thinking, now how, why would the devil, how could the devil tell his creator to worship him? But he, what he was telling him, if you look the word up, in the Greek, it literally means, if you will serve me. We don't have to bow our knee to the devil. All we have to do is serve him. And unfortunately, some of us serve him every single day. And yet we still go to church when the church meets, thinking that we're doing service for God. In Esther, chapter 3, this is, this is Haman. Haman... Haman loved to have the preeminence. Haman was a man who hated the Jews. He hated God's people. And he was an ambitious man. And he was going to do whatever he had to do to come to power and get power. Even though he couldn't be the king, he was going to do what he could to get as close to the king as possible. Kind of like politicians today. See, the goal of the politician is to be as close to the person who's just ahead of you. And so it's, it's a lifelong ambition. Because the person, the minute you get to that, to that status of the person that you were going after, you now have to get to the next person, and the next person, and the next person, and the next person. And what you have to do to get there, you have to sell your soul. And Haman was ready to sell his soul to do and get what he wanted. So in Esther chapter 3, it says, After these things did King Ahasuerus promote Haman, the son of whoever this person was, the Haggai. The Agite, excuse me, and they had, and, and advanced him and set him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. In other words, Haman was now number two man, vice president, chancellor, whatever you want to call him. He was the second in command, and everybody was going to listen to him, or he was going to destroy their lives. Because he didn't care what the king wanted, he cared what he wanted. See, if he was a true servant, he would have cared what the king wanted. But he didn't care what the king wanted. He lied to the king, he, he, uh, um, he misrepresented the king uh, of, of matters that were going on in the country. And so in verse 2, and all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and, and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not 
Neither did he reverence him. Oh, man. One man. Can you imagine? This one guy is not going to bow unto Haman. And everybody was commanded to bow unto Haman. So in verse 3, it says, The king's servants, which were in the king's gate, said to Mordecai, Why do you transgress the king's commandment? So in verse 4, it says, Now it came to pass when they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not. They, they kept talking to Mordecai, but he didn't hearken unto them. Then they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand, for he had told them that he was a Jew. And in verse 5, when, when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And that's what happens to people who want to have the preeminence. Jesus Christ doesn't feel that way. See, because he already owns it. He already has everything. That's why you've heard me say before, God is a jealous God. God is a jealous God that jealousy, a good type of jealousy, will guard what it has. And God can do that because he's God. But you know, the scripture never says that God is an envious God. Because what, what jealousy does, again, is it guards over the top. But what envy does is it, from the bottom, looks up trying to grab and claw what it can't have. And, of course, God doesn't have to do that. But that's what was happening here uh, with Haman, is that Haman was envious. Number one, he was jealous. An evil spirit of jealousy was working here. But he was also working with envy because Haman, because Mordecai would not bow unto him. And he was full of wrath and full of anger, and we know the rest of the story for the sake of time, is that he did all he could to entrap him, to kill him and God's people because he would not bow unto him. And there are many people today that stand behind pulpits that that if their congregations won't bow unto them, if their people won't, won't worship them as the great leader of the church, they will. many people have gotten the left foot of fellowship. And there are some that are here that have gotten the left foot of fellowship because they stood for God's word and they stood against the error and the problems that are going on in the church. They didn't stand up and, and, and rail against the pastor. All they did was talk to him. Or they tried to bring deliverance into the church. And the pastor doesn't want anything to do with that because he doesn't want to take his tie off. He doesn't want to get his, his $400 sport coat wrinkled. He doesn't want to get all sweaty for God's people. But when God's people have a problem, what does he do? He sends them to the Christian psychologist to fill them full of drugs. Uh, there's somebody very close to me who went to the head Christian psychologist in the United States. The man, and everybody knows, knows who he is. He's got a radio program. He's got a big Big old, they got a big old thing. They have two people there. I believe they're called Minrith and Meyer. And somebody very close to me went to Frank Meyer. And all of a sudden, what did Frank Meyer do? He counseled him, filled him full of drugs. Because that's the answer for God's people, right? That's the same answer the world has. God has something better for us. But that's up to us. That means that we have to fall out of agreement with the things that the devil is doing and let Jesus Christ be the bishop and shepherd of our souls. We have to open ourselves up unto him as a faithful creator because in our patience we must possess our souls because if we don't, something else is going to. Amen? We've got to get out of the self-life. And I'm going to just read some verses here for the sake of time because it is so important. You know, today we're told we've got to have self-esteem. And there are many people, such as Robert Schuller, who teaches this doctrine of self-esteem. We've got, in, in fact, he says, if you don't, he says, somebody asked him one time, what is hell? He says, somebody who has low self-esteem. And I'm thinking, no, but you'll find out. <laughs> I mean, if that's, if that's what his theology is all about. But what does the Bible say about, about uh, self-esteem? Philippians 2, 3 and 4, if you'd write it down. Paul writes, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, in lowliness of mind, in lowliness, lowliness of mind, let each esteem others, huh? Let each esteem others better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Think on that esteeming others more highly than ourselves. But we can't do that because they're not as good as us, are they? 
You know, it's funny today. This is, this, this, the scriptures are full of this kind of stuff. 1 Corinthians 10, 24. Let no man seek his own, but every, but every man's other's wealth. In other words, don't seek it for yourself. Seek it for somebody else. Because when you seek it for somebody else, God will reward you openly. He will give unto you. And when he gives unto us, wow, he gives unto us big time. 1 Corinthians 9, 19. For though I be free from all men, Paul writes, yet have I made myself servant unto all. And why did Paul make himself servant unto all? That he might gain the more. See, we can have great gain with God if we will become servant unto all. Romans 15, 1 through 3. We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Forget that, bearing the infirmities of the weak. Let them bear themselves. Isn't that what the Bible says? Every man shall bear his own burden. <laughs> Galatians. But they forget a couple other verses from there. It, sa it says that we are to bear one another's burdens. We don't have time to go into the rest. of Just re research things out about humility. Pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride will destroy our lives and has destroyed. And because Jesus is not allowed to work in the churches because there's too much pride and arrogance in the church. We must start giving of ourselves, especially in the deliverance ministry, or else God will shut the thing down and he'll go around us. And we don't want that, do we? No. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together to share and fellowship in your word, Father. Lord, we ask that now, Lord, you would help us to fall out of agreement with the devil and that you would help us, Father, to embrace the, embrace the teachings of your word, Father, that we can deny ourselves and take up our cross so that we can minister unto, unto our brothers and sisters, Father, that are in need. And Lord, even if this is not in our heart and we want it to be in our heart, Father, help us to fall out of agreement, Father, so that we can have this in our heart, Father. And we ask this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.